Hi, everybody. Welcome to Conversations with the Curator. My name is Ann Wegman, and I am the Animal Resources Coordinator at Cincinnati Museum Center. My job is to take care of the live animals here at the museum. And I know many of you are saying, oh my goodness, I didn't even know that you had live animals at the museum. This is a, a comment that I get a lot. We actually have a lot of animals here at the museum. We have 72 animals, I counted them up today in my head, here at the museum, including 25 big brown bats, 10 snakes, eight turtles, 17 salamanders, nine toads and frogs, four lizards, six crayfish, and one tarantula. So that's about, that's a lot of animals. That also does not include our insects or our feeder colonies of insects or the fish in our fish tanks. And when you throw all of those in there together, it's hundreds of animals and something like 42 different species. So I and my staff are caring for all of these animals, both behind the scenes and on the floor. The animals are part of the exhibits. They are also part of programs. We do public programs with our exhibits and we have um, animals that are used in birthday parties and, and they go on outreach programs and all kinds of things like that. So post your comments and questions and I will try and get to them. Also, you might wonder where I am. This is my brand new animal resources room. When we moved back into the museum, we were able to have a dedicated space for our department. So you see my dryers over here, my washers over here. I also have a kitchen in this room and it's also where my computer is and where I do all the work. So where I'm taking care of the animals here at the museum that are not on the floor, it's happening here at the museum. So um, people are asking if I have a favorite educational animal, which one and why. I actually, I love all native creatures mostly. And so um, I have a rotating cast of who I like the most at which time of year. This time of year, my favorite's probably um, salamanders because it's their time of year. Um, how did you get bats into our live collection? Charlie Harper is asking. That is actually the best question because it's actually why we have an animal resources department in the first place. So when I graduated from Miami University with my degree in zoology, this job at the museum was my first job out of college. And we were opening the cave exhibit at the museum. And our brilliant idea was to have a free flying bat colony that would live in the cave, fly out through a tunnel, eat bugs in the neighborhood, fly back in through the tunnel and then live with us. So they would be sort of captive, but not really. We weren't planning on feeding them. And the cave was actually designed to, to have the temperature lowered in such a way that the bats could hibernate there and live there happily all year round. So we had the bats in the cave and then the time came for us to open the tunnel and let them fly out and they did and they flew home. So most of our bats then flew away and they went back to the places where we had collected them. We actually checked later with those people and they made it back. And so we were left with some of um, some babies that had been born that were not able to fly well enough to fly out and some older bats. And those that became the core of our animal collection. So that's how we ended up with live bats at the museum. Since then, um, we have had staff members years ago that um, were licensed rehabbers with the state of Ohio. And then we, of course, have our permits through the United, through the USDA um, department, it's APHIS, Department of Plant and Animal Services, and also um, with the state. And so we get orphan bats sometimes from there. So our colony is about 25 right now. And yes, it is a lot of animals I'm seeing. I'm see if I could scroll down here. Sorry about this. There we go. <laughs> Maria is asking, what can I share about cicadas? I should have mentioned that if it was this time next year, that would be my favorite animal. I love periodical cicadas here in Cincinnati. I think we have brood 10, I'm not quite sure, but we have the 17 year cicadas and next year is their year. Um, they will 17 years ago have emerged and laid their eggs on the underside of um, twigs. And then those uh, nymphs drop to the ground. And for 17 years, the nymphs live underground sucking um, juices from tree roots, and then they will emerge next year and do their thing early in the, around now, it's around May, but they come out and do their thing. I am not sure if this is actually a thing, but the moles in my yard always, at, right about when the cicadas are ready to emerge the next year, in a couple of years from that, I seem to have more moles. And I think they're crawling under there and eating them. I don't know if that's actually a thing, but it's my favorite. Okay, sorry about this. I was warned that I would have to scroll down. 
Okay, so someone says, do you have any animals you can show us now? Yes, I do actually have some animals that I can show us now. So let me put this up here and I'm just gonna slide that back. Hopefully you can, there we go. So this is one of our um, most popular creatures at the museum. And you might have known and loved her in the past. This is Shelly, our Eastern box turtle. So Eastern box turtles are now I think called woodland box turtles are um, one of several species of turtles that we have in the state of Ohio, but this is the only box turtle that we have here. And Shelly has been living with us here at the museum since 1990. So she has been here a long time. Was she, so that makes it what, 30 years for the, at least that long. She was probably at least 15 years old when we had her, even maybe older than that. She was actually found by a staff member by some railroad tracks. For years, we told the story that she was hit by a train. I now have decided that that's a little extreme, but she is, you might notice, missing. This whole part of her shell right here is um, a fiberglass mold. And then this is some fiberglass to hold it on. And then there's some plumber's epoxy to hold her top and bottom together. So she actually did lose a big chunk of her shell. And of course, obviously she survived and did very well. And I think originally the plan was to paint it. I don't know if you can tell, but we actually took a mold from a real turtle shell that was about her size to give her that piece to kind of be perfectly fitted onto her. And if you wanna visit that mold, when we open our cave exhibit again in the future, it's actually the turtle shell at the top of the stairs when you're in the cave, um, representing a turtle that fell into the cave and died in the cave. So um, that's, that's what it looks like. Oh, Shelly is a female box turtle. Hang on one second, let me just, there we go. She is a female box turtle. There's several ways to tell box turtle males from females. Um, one of them is the tail. So I'm gonna turn Shelly around and show you her tail. This is her tail right there. I don't know if you can tell how tiny it is. It's very short. Female box turtles have very short tails. Another way to tell is by looking at the turtle's eyes. So we're gonna look at Shelly's eye. Wait, let's turn it that way. And usually box turtle males will have red eyes. You might notice that Shelly's eyes look orange. Every female turtle we've ever had at the museum has also had orange or red eyes. So that's clearly not definitive. The thing that you can really tell the difference between the male and the female is by looking at the plastron, which is the bottom of the shell, and it's really flat. So Shelly's, oh look, you can tell. If this had been a male turtle, my finger would kind of go in there in a, dent, in a concavity right there, a dent, and that would show us that that's a male. So wait, let me, she wants to crawl around. You might've noticed when I'm picking her up, I'm always trying to use two hands, at least I should be. Um, the way to, to handle a turtle properly, if you need to get one off the side of the road, this is called the hamburger hold. Look at all that I've got there. And then my fingers right here are on her shoulder girdle. Turtles, obviously, are land dwelling creatures and picking them up by the shell without some support underneath really freaks them out. Another thing that I always want to remind turtle about tur people about turtles, especially this time of year when box turtles are traveling, um, maybe to, you know, to lay eggs or whatever, they sometimes are crossing roads. Turtles do have a home territory. If you remove them and take them to the safety of your backyard, they're just gonna try and get back to where they were. So if you come across a turtle in the road and it's in the middle of the road or it looks like it's crossing, do it a favor and help it across the road if it's safe to do so. Um, but don't take it home because it's gonna have a better life in your yard because it won't. So all of the turtles at our museum were like Shelly, they're rescues that couldn't be returned to the wild. So here, let's turn this way so people can see her sad shell tail. There we go slider right there. Yes, this is our, oops, our little Shelly. Wait, where'd you go? There she is. There we go. So Shelly lives in the Children's Museum and the Duke Energy Children's Museum in a uh, enclosure. Um, she gets a bath every week and every week we sanitize her enclosure. And hopefully she'll live to a ripe old age of maybe 85, maybe longer than that. So at this point, we have children coming to the Children's Museum whose parents remember Shelly. And so maybe that'll happen with grandchildren someday as well. I think Shelly is everybody's favorite. We have people saying that they love Shelly. Um, she certainly is charismatic as far as turtles go. Can you say hi? Look at that. So that is Shelly, our Eastern box turtle. 
I'm going to slide her back down here. You can sanitize myself. And I will show you another one of our creatures. So this is another um, animal that we have common in the backyard. This one maybe not so welcome for some people as a turtle might be, um, but certainly a very, very, very important creature in the ecosystem. Gotta get to it. These are king size pillowcases, they're very large. Here we go. So this snake is one that um, in the past was called the black rat snake or the pilot snake or just the black snake. But these days, um, the Department of Natural Resources in Ohio is calling them the gray rat snake. But I think just about everybody should be seeing these in their yard. This is a snake that is highly arboreal. It means they like to climb trees and they eat rats and mice, birds, things like that. So um, he can get to be about six feet long. That would be a really, really big black rat snake. Um, many snakes in our part of the world by that time have been run over by cars or um, a misinformed person has decided the world is better off without the snake, which um, is very sad. So this guy is about four feet long, like maybe four and a half. And he's trying to, I was trying to show you his face. There we go. You might notice that the snake is um, sticking his tongue out. Snakes get a lot of information from their sense of smell. And they're actually smelling with their tongues. So he's sticking his tongue out. You might even notice that it's forked. So he's got a left side and a right side to his tongue. Um, and then he sticks his tongue into the roof of his mouth into something called the Jacobson's organ. And that helps him determine, um, he's smelling the camera pretty well, that helps him determine where the smells are coming from. So he has directional smelling. So if he gets a little more mouth smell from the left side, he'll know to go to the left. A little more mouth smell from the right side, he'll know to go to the right. There we go, right there. Oops, there we go. There he is. So you might notice that it looks like snakes have no bones. They actually have lots and lots of bones. Um, they just don't have arm bones and leg bones and hand bones and foot bones. So our snake has skull bones and then many, many vertebra, lots of backbones and then ribs attached to each one of those backbones. And then past where he goes to the bathroom, his cloaca are all of his tail bones. So you might notice he's on the computer now. You might notice that his tail scales are kind of, um, there's two of them there. That's how we tell those that's his tail. So when we look at the belly of the snake, these are his scutes. There we go. And that is how he is moving. Each one of those scutes is attached to its own set of muscles and ribs. And he can easily pull each one of them individually over things as he climbs. And he's climbing over there. So I do have his snake skin here. This is his latest shed. Snakes. Their, their skins do not grow along with them, so they have to shed their skins. And so this is, like I said, his latest one. You might see, oh, you can kind of see the little eye caps in there. So they shed their eye caps as well. That's all part of the shed. And the snake sort of um, rubs its nose on things and then crawls out from the shed just like a sock, like it's inside out, which is pretty cool. So we actually have a larger black rat snake here at the museum. This is his shed. So this snake is actually, this one's about six feet long. So that's quite a large shed. Okay. All right, sorry. Oh, I should tell you how we acquired the snake. So this guy came to us as a rescue again. Um, you might notice he's got some pink scales right there. That's actually his skin. So he was actually stuck to carpet tape as a hatchling. So he was found um, and taken to a vet's office. And when they took the carpet tape off, it was determined that um, he'd missed some scales. So he'd be safer living his life in captivity. And by then he'd already, you know, lived with people for a while. So we ended up with 
So I have a question. Do you have to encourage indoor snakes to hibernate by changing the temperature or do they start slowing down by instinct when it's time? They don't actually hibernate here with us because we don't lower the temperature so they can't actually hibernate. They do sometimes eat less in the winter time, but we do not hibernate our snakes. Um, we thought we were gonna have to hibernate the bats as well and they don't hibernate either. It doesn't seem to affect anyone's lifespan. So things are kind of okay. Does this snake have a name? Oh my gosh, I can't believe I forgot to let you know this is snake's name. This snake's name is Salazar Slytherin. So um, we're big Harry Potter fans around here. Salazar Slytherin is our snake's name. Where are you going? Our new milk snakes are named Louis and Pasteur. We're also quite punny around here. There we go. So this snake is, he actually lives at the cave exhibit. This is one of the reasons why I love using live animals um, on the floor and in exhibits. So this is an animal that might, um, wouldn't live in a cave, but certainly there are animals in caves that this snake would eat. And there are records of snakes in other parts of the world that hang over the edges of caves and um, eat emerging bats. There's actually a bat eating snake in another part of the world. So, Rat snakes would certainly take advantage of some of the creatures that might be living in the cave. So if you come to visit the museum, when um, you will see him near the cave exhibit. There we go, okay. All right, let me put you back in your snake. Well, actually I could probably hold on to you while I talk. That would be a good thing, okay. All right, so someone asked me, what do you do to feed the animals? So each of our animals has a different diet, obviously. The bats are actually on a diet of live insects because um, live bats are actually, of course, flying around eating bugs. And so our bats can't do that. So we actually have trained them to eat mealworms from a dish. So I have a mealworms that come um, in the mail in a bag and then they end up on a substrate of baby oatmeal and bone meal and vitamins and mineral powder and then fresh fruits and vegetables for moisture and that's what we feed our bats. The snakes of course are getting um, rodents. So some of our, so we have garter snakes as well. They're, those are eating, well, not, we have garter snake and two decays brown snakes. They can also eat earthworms, but most of our snakes are eating um, rodents and we buy them frozen in a bag like a chicken breast and thaw them out and they eat frozen thawed. Our fish are eating frozen fish food and also um, dried food like you would feed your fish. The turtles eat a wide variety of things because most of our turtles here at the museum are omnivores. So they're eating plants and meat. So I make something called turtle brownie for our box turtle, which is chicken and steak and greens and baby food and gelatin. And I mix it up and that turns into a delicious cube of, um, yummy stuff. They also eat fruits and vegetables. They're eating also um, scrambled eggs. And then what else do we have? Oh, the salamanders. Salamanders are eating um, waxworms, crickets, and stuff like that. Adeline is asking, how old is the snake? We have had the snake for seven years. So the snake is seven years old. Now snakes continue to grow like all reptiles through their entire life. So he's going to keep growing, but as he gets older, he will um, grow more slowly. So hopefully he'll live long enough to be a big six foot long snake. Do we do any sort of enrichment for our animals? That's a really good question. Um, most of the enrichment for our animals is meeting the public and doing stuff like that. We also change up their enclosures a lot. You know, the water dish is on a different side every time. Um, the turtles get to crawl around the museum and outside the museum, they get to go outside. And we have been toying with making a snake board for the snakes where they could climb. So we might work, work on that, but yeah. How long does it take to feed the animals each day? We are asked. It takes about four hours. A lot of that is actually um, walking from place to place. When we had animals all over the museum, it took even longer. And um, I would say that, and then it never is just a straight, you know, walk in and put the food down because Somebody might have gone to the bathroom and you need to clean that up or there's, you know, water needs to be changed. So it all, it adds up to a lot. <laughs> One of my former interns is saying she misses the snake. I know, I know it's, uh, if they miss you, I think that the, the animals, you know, they, they would like to have people back. Maybe not the snakes so much, snakes, you know, but the turtles certainly. 
Oops, there it goes. He is a cutie. So someone asked me one time if I've ever been bitten um, by the animals at the museum. I have been bitten by, by the bats. Um, don't worry, I've been vaccinated for rabies many times and our bats don't have rabies. Um, I once was bitten by our ball python and I didn't even realize it. It was so fast and his teeth are really short so there wasn't, really wasn't much to there. And then um, our milk snakes, when they were babies, um, one just attached itself to my finger and I had to sort of peel it off. So that wasn't that big of a deal. And then someone else asked me, what is some of the craziest thing that's ever happened with the animals at the museum? Um, we do bat flight every day. And so the bats are flying around and I'm in a cage with them. In our old flight cage one time, um, I was in there with long pants on and a bat walked all the way up my pants. And so I had to finish the program and then sort of wait for everyone to leave before I could retrieve the bat. We also had a snake named Houdini. Um, he came by that name, honestly, and actually escaped several times in the museum before I, I, when I started a long time ago, then I took some time off um, when my kids were little and then came back. During that time, that's when we acquired Houdini and he was, um, he was free in the office area several times. And then when I was working here, a coworker left his cage open accidentally and um, he was gone for six weeks. So at that point, it's like, you're, you might not catch him. And um, I was looking for him every day. And one day I found his shed skin and I walked 20 feet away and there he was. So in six weeks, he'd gone like 20 feet. So that's probably about it. Oh, and then there was the time that I was at Kroger and um, there was a man behind me who said, ma'am, and I said, yes. And he said, I really don't know how to tell you this, but there seems to be a bug in your hair. And sure enough, there was a mealworm in my hair, which happens more often than not, um, but not usually in the Kroger checkout line. There he is. Yeah. Your snakes have different personalities. Anyone get grumpier, friendlier than others? That actually is a, a really good question. I often say that there's not much to a snake brain behind, besides like hungry, not hungry, you know, sleepy, not sleepy, whatever. Um, some of our snakes are easier to handle than others, and some of them don't seem to mind it quite as much, but I wouldn't say that they have personalities um, as much as I would about some of our other creatures. The turtles definitely have personalities. Oh, the difference between venomous and poisonous and when to use those terms. That's a really um, good question. So a venomous animal is one that has, um, is able to inject poison basically. So they have a venom sac, like, a, like, um, like spiders or pit vipers. And so you are injected with venom. A poisonous thing is something that is, has the poison in its tissues. So you are poisoned by eating it. So people always say you're injected with venom and you ingest poison. So if you think of like mushrooms or whatever, if you ate a poisonous mushroom, that's how it would make you sick. So a lot of people talk about poisonous snakes. Um, I guess technically that's not really true. You can eat any snake you want and you're not gonna get sick, but a venomous snake that would, would bite you would be the one that would make you ill. We have three venomous snakes in the state of Ohio. None of them are um, close to Cincinnati. And um, they're not deadly, deadly venomous. And they're really good at staying away from people. So you'll probably never even see one. How long is the snake? That is a good question. Have I measured him recently? I don't know. I'm guessing four feet, five feet. His shed was five feet. So their sheds are, are a, little, a little longer than they are. So he's probably more like four and a half feet. The way that you measure a snake in the field is you get him to crawl through like a Lexan tube and then they have to be, they have to straighten out and we don't have a snake tube big enough for this guy. So sometimes I lay him out on the ground and sort of guesstimate. One time I had a coworker lay on the ground and she is um, 5'11 and our snake was a little bit longer. So we determined that our largest black rat snake was six feet. So I missed it, what kind of snake is this? This is a um, gray rat snake, also known as a black rat snake, the pilot rat snake, the black snake, if you've seen a large snake, this is the largest common snake in Ohio. If you've seen a big snake in your yard, it's one of these guys. He's in my Fitbit. Hang on for a second. Happens all the time. Do snakes give warnings before they bite? This is a really good question. Um, many snakes will rattle their tail, whether they're venomous snakes or not. 
um, whether they're annoyed. So that's pretty much the warning that you're going to get. The this this snake, the gray rat snake, rattling a tail, rattling this tail in dry leaves would sound like a rattlesnake to you, so you would leave it alone. Um, but other than that, I'm not actually sure. Let's see, how many times a day do they go to the bathroom? This is why snakes are a better reptile pet than lizards, in my opinion. Now, you're not gonna have this snake as a pet because it's a native, it's a native animal, it's protected. So, um, but snakes eat as often as they go to the bathroom or as often, snakes go to the bathroom as often as they eat. So if they eat once every two weeks, they go to the bathroom once every two weeks. So the snake goes to the bathroom once every two weeks which makes it really easy. We have some snakes here like our garter snake who eats three times a week, a little faster metabolism maybe, and he's a smaller little guy. He eats a little smaller amounts of food. So he, he goes off to the bathroom a little more often. But this guy is on a once every two week schedule, which is perfect for all of us here at the museum. Okay, it looks like I have a couple more minutes left. Is that, did anyone miss Shelly? I could get Shelly out again and have her say hi to people. Let's say goodbye to this guy. All right. How many times a day do you feed a snake? Adeline says. You feed, it depends on the size of the snake. Hi, Sean. It depends on the size of the snake. And most snakes are only eating a couple of times a week at the most. This snake only eats twice a month. So, you know, that's not very much. So I'm going to put the snake back in its snake bag. This is a lovely king size pillowcase. Hopefully, I can get him back in here. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna get Shelly out for the next couple minutes. People are missing her. Let me, I gotta put a knot in it because, you know, yeah. Okay, a little hand sanitize. We'll get the Shelly box out and then I'll pull Shelly out. Okay. I can, she's climbing around in her box, I can hear her. So she wants to visit people, I know. So there's Shelly. Wait, let me back her up a little bit. Actually, now I've got the, there she is. I have lots of museum co-workers on that are missing Shelly. Everyone misses Shelly. She missed you guys too. She skipped eating for a couple of weeks, but then I tempted her with an earthworm and now she's, she's back on it. So she's all good. Watching Shelly eat an earthworm is truly a joy because she looks like a bird of prey or a raptor going down in there for it. Okay. There she goes. She's crawling about. I was trying to try and get her to eat something, but she won't. I know she is so cute. So she looks pretty good for almost 50, right? You think? Wanna say hi? There we go. So remember when you're holding a turtle, always support from the bottom and do not bring them home with you. They don't wanna live in your house. They want to live in the wild. How old is the turtle? Someone asked. We have had Shelly here at the museum since 1990. So she was an adult then. And so she was probably at least 10 or 15. So we tell people she's near 50. What's her favorite snack? Shelly Belly's favorite snack is definitely night crawlers. She um, will eat them when she's, when she's decided that she's tired of everything else. She also likes omelets. On Sunday, we give our snakes scrambled eggs and she likes hers with tomatoes in it. She does like bananas. She's not a huge fan of strawberries, but she, lo she loves corn kernels. Now that's kind of more of a treat, but if we give her a pile of mixed vegetables, she will eat all the corn first. So she's still, you know, turtles are omnivores. They're eating meat and plants. So we make sure that she does stuff like that. Okay. So I think that we're just about done. If you've enjoyed our program today, please um, check us out on social media. It's um, Cincy with a Y, C I N C Y museum.org. There's also links on our webpage that you could join us or donate as we um, depend on ticket sales for income. So if you feel like you just want to um, donate, that would be great too. And hopefully we'll see you again with some other creatures. And uh, thanks a lot for joining us today. See you later. Wait, let me put Shelly down first before I turn this off. Okay, thanks for joining us, everybody.